So what it is and what it isn't. So what it is not is not an introduction to Arista or Arista campus. Um, with POCs, we kind of jump straight into the uh, technology. It's kind of nice. There's no, no marketing or minimal marketing in it. It's not an introduction to EOS or CVP. So if you haven't worked with those, we encourage you to go to either a campus builders or maybe an ATD uh, with your local account teams. But this is just intended to dive uh, straight into an environment that's live uh, using actual hardware and actual uh, CVP instances and demonstrate these things. So know that this is being done from home for everybody. So please have grace with us if there's a dog's barking or PlayStation emergencies, that kind of thing. You know, why is Arista getting into the campus and into these other parts of the network? You know, we got our start in the data center. Uh, but now we're actually getting into campus, we're getting into public cloud, we're getting into more deeper into tap aggregation. And the reason for it is EOS is so extensible, basically with the same operating system and the same management suite, we're able to get into different parts of your network. And the exciting thing about this is, you know, even though it's a different part of your network, there's a lot of overlap with how we would handle it a network in the campus like we would in a data center. So there's not a bunch of new control planes. You know, a lot of our competitors out there will have different business units or maybe different uh, management suites that manage uh, different parts of your network. What it ends up happening is different people have to manage these different products. We see you more as an empowered engineer that capable of automation and capable of using the same network operating system in the data center and then basically expand that story into the campus. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about some of these things on the EOS side as well as Cloud Vision. A bit of housekeeping, um, please, if you, have, if you have questions as we go through this, please post them in the Q&A window. Uh, we have a panel of engineers here to help answer these and we'll try to answer them live. If there's questions you'd like to see from the PLC team, we'll relay those over. We'll have surveys going throughout this session. Feel free to participate in those and we'll share the results afterwards. If there's questions we can do live, we'll get them. If, if not, we'll circle back and follow up that we have a team uh, ready to answer those types of things. After this meeting ends, there'll be a survey that gets sent to you. Uh, please provide feedback. That's something that, um, this is kind of a new format for Arista. Uh, doing POCs virtually and mass. You know, we'd love any feedback to make these better for uh, future sessions. A quick uh, roll call of who's on the call here uh, from the POC team. We have Neha and Charlene. So Neha is going to get into uh, Cloud Vision, and then Charlene after that is going to get uh, more into the specific EOS pieces of kind of campus specific pieces. So talking about things like port profiles, phone support, dot one X. Uh, Neha on Cloud Vision is going to show all these things listed and a lot more. Um, Cloud Vision is kind of a cool management software. And again, this is the same consistent software we use in the data center and tap aggregation and edge uh, management, cloud deployments. Another part of the network doesn't have to be another management suite. And so there's a lot of overlap between those. This is a quick kind of overview of the topology. So like I said, this is on real hardware. Um, these are some of our campus specific devices. So you see the, these kind of pseudo random looking device names. And you'll see 7050, 720, 7300. These are all parts of the campus suites uh, that we're actually demonstrating on. So again, this is live hardware. Uh, we have Ixia running to, to generate traffic as well as a few phones and APs and things like that. We're, we're not going to get specifically into kind of layer two or layer three approach, kind of a, the overall architecture, uh, just for the sake of time. So we're really focusing on the kind of access port out or the access switch, access leaf out and then the management piece. But if you wanna see like an EVPN specific campus or a MLAG layer two specific campus POC, we can certainly do that in a uh, custom POC for your uh, company. Quick introduction to some of the hardware uh, that, that's in these labs. So from left to right, these are the first PLE switches that Arisa's introduced. These are all one RU, you have 24 port and 48 port options. And then the, on the left and the right, the kind of the primary difference is multi-gig versus non-multi-gig. The big driver multi-gig being kind of the next generation of Wi-Fi 6 APs, which we also have in our product portfolio. There's also a 90 96 port and kind of the next next iteration of, uh, of switch SKUs out there. So this is 96 port. Every every port is capable of running multi-gig as well as um, 60 watts. So again, this, this could be driven by some of the next-gen Wi-Fi 6 APs out there as well as other kind of PoE applications that may come into play. They're all going to be using the same EOS that we use on all Arista switches. So it's kind of nice. You don't have to have a different network operating system for one part of your network or the other. And so single binary story still stays true for uh, for the campus. To kind of kick us off here, um, we're, we're going to talk about Cloud Vision first. Neha is going to do some demonstrations. And the high level info on, on Cloud Vision is, is really kind of cradle to grave management of a switch from provisioning it, from bringing it on board, checking compliance, auditing for things like you know, CVEs and uh, security vulnerabilities and things like that, to showing visualizations of what the network looks like and showing things like you would normally have to log into a bunch of switches as you show commands and kind of connect the dots in your head or on paper. We do these things for you using things like telemetry and overlaying information onto these um, views that we have your network. Neha is going to show how to quickly like push out configuration, audit switch deployments, as well as show some of the campus specific stuff like flows that are going between different 
endpoints, how often they're talking, who they're talking to, if they should or shouldn't be talking, that kind of thing. So we're going to hand it off to Neha. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to do a walkthrough for you for the CVP, that is Arista's Cloud Vision portal. To give you an overview of CVP, Arista's Cloud Vision provides a turnkey cloud networking solution that uses real-time telemetry and analytics to give us visibility into network state, automated provisioning, and change management. It provides us with a single management plane platform for third-party ecosystem integration across data centers, hybrid cloud, and campus networks. We also integrate with a broad array of Arista's partner solutions, including VMware, uh, Palo Alto Networks, um, ServiceNow, Fortinet, and many others. Now, CVP has certain advantages over legacy network visibility approaches, which are based on periodic polling mechanisms like SNMP. Uh, they only op update every polling interval and also waste cycles repeatedly pulling data that has not changed. Whereas CVP uses a state-based approach. EOS devices are configured to stream device state data to CVP using Terminator agent that is run on the EOS and Terminator exports the data to CVP in gRPC format. Streaming makes the updates possible at the very instant a change is made. The infrequent polling with SNMP could lead to missing of many events, and the inflexible MIPS would limit the actual network state that can be collected. With CVP, we can get a lot more. We can get configurations, we can get buffers, counter information, flow data, and whatnot. Also, Cloud Vision keeps historical data in a time series database, which includes a history of network state, configuration, software versions, which makes CVP a very powerful tool for any kind of troubleshooting. Now let's talk about the access control. If I go to the settings page here, there is this access control tab. Here you can specify the uh, kind of authentication and authorization, and all your AAA servers can be uh, put here. So Cloud Vision operates with this role-based privileges integrated into existing authentication tools. It could be AAA, Radius, or TACAX. And here, under the users and roles, you can have this configuration where you allow which, which user is allowed to do what. So you associate these users with these rules, uh, roles, which are specified here. And these roles have these different read or write permissions that can be configured as per your needs. So by default, CVP provides these two roles, which is network admin and network operator. And activity of any CVP user is logged and can be viewed under this uh, audit logs. You can go to, you can choose your uh, role, and then you can see what all activities has been done by this particular uh, user. Coming to the devices tab, this is where we see an inventory of all the devices that are being managed by CVP. Zero touch provisioning provides the agility to bring up new networks or add capacity to existing networks efficiently. And that makes CVP equally suitable for greenfield deployments or brownfield deployments. Now coming to uh, any of the devices, if I click on this, it will take me to uh, this, uh, the details of this particular switch. So here you can see what all are the system details. What's the model for this device? What's the software version it's running? And so on. And here you have this option to SSH to the device directly from here. On the bottom, you can see it gives us the details on the interface counts. And here you can uh, click on more and see this in a lot more detail. On the left pane here, you have all this information from this device that is being constantly streamed to CVP. So you can look at the system process information. So here you can see how my CPU utilization has been changing for this particular device. And it uh, quickly tells me how the device has been performing. Other than that, you can see the hardware capacity of the running configurations. So here you see it shows me the utilization of different tables that are available on this device. And then we also have uh, these um, ARP tables, routing tables, uh, traffic flow information, and all the interface uh, statistics that I would need. We will look at uh, some of these in detail later. Let's go back to the devices. So here, and, uh, next to the device, you can see that we have all this information, which again talks about the model, the software, IP address, et cetera. And under the status, there's a checkbox and this uh, bug sign. If I click here, it will tell me what all bugs this device is vulnerable to. Now, if you want to see the whole system uh, compliance, you can go to this compliance overview page. Here we show 
the bug exposure for all the devices in the network. And this has two more sections where it shows you the exposure to the CVs and how does the system look like right now? What's the configuration and software compliance of the devices? Now, looking at this list here, this shows you all the bugs and CVs uh, your network is exposed to. And it also tells you it's affecting which of the devices. So in my network, I have 18 devices and all 18 of them are exposed to high priority bugs. And out of the 18 devices, two are exposed to some security advisories and six are out of compliance. Now talking about these bugs, you can get all the details about them here. You can go here and look at uh, what version they were introduced in, what versions they are fixed in, and what all devices they are affecting. Same thing for CV. Uh, sometimes we have these uh, security patches available for uh, certain CVs, like you can see here. There's a link provided uh, for the same. And if we go to this link, it will tell us a lot more information in detail. What's, wh uh, what are the affected software? What are the affected platforms? And here under EOS, you can see that there's a patch available for this. So this patch can be uploaded to our CVP and made part of an image bundle, which we'll be talking about later. And once it's part of an image bundle, it can be pushed directly to the switch from CVP with just one click. And CVP will push that uh, switch to the device and it will also install it. So in this way, you can take care of any security advisories that affect your network. Now this uh, database that you see here is based on the device models and the EOS versions you are running in your network. In the future, we are also going to provide the granularity to get this data based on the running configuration of the devices. So if you have some feature configured, say OSPF or multicast PIM, so you will see bugs related to only those that will affect you. But if you don't have, say, BGP in your network, you won't see any bugs related to BGP. And for looking at the device and um, the configuration and software mismatch, you can go to the device configuration. And here it will tell you what devices are out of sync and what is out of sync. So on BIA209, you can see that the configuration is out of sync. And uh, for BRI270, the image is out of sync and so on. And on the last device here, you can see the uh, image and extensions are out of sync. So in this way, you can see that we have this customized bug scrub available, which can help you manage your risks and avoid any issues and make informed decisions while upgrading. And CVP gets this uh, bug alert database from arista.com and it's updated every 30 minutes. Let's go to our provisioning page. We'll come back to the other options under devices uh, later on. Okay, so our day-to-day -day operations uh, involve managing software, hardware, configurations, and images, which can be easily automated with CVP. Operators can organize devices in logical hierarchies that you can say, see here through container views that helps with rapid categorization of devices by role, its type, location, or any other specification you want. The switches at the bottom will inherit any configuration and software images that might be specified on the containers above them. So here in my network, I have classified my devices based on their role in the network. Like all my leaves are put in this container leaf. All my spines are put under this container spine. And then I have this spline and van containers which have the associated devices with them. Configurations can be broken down into more manageable configlets and are ready for network wide or group specific provisioning. And similarly, image bundles consisting of software images, extensions, and patches can be created and associated at different levels, be it the device level, the container level, or the top level container. This kind of config modularity and config and image reuse across devices simplifies everyday config change and image management. And a compliance check can be run on any container or on any device level, and that will tell you if the devices are in compliance or not. Let me run a compliance check here. And now what CVP is going to do is it's going to check the state of these two devices, which is the current configuration and image on the devices with what CVP knows of them. So when the devices are first onboarded, CVP and, and a compliance check is run. CVP will get the running configuration from the device and save it as a reconciled configuration. And it will also know the software version of the device. And then as we uh, manage our network, if we change the images and the running configurations, we'll keep 
saving a source of truth in CVP's database. And if at any time any unauthorized change is made to the devices, it will be caught in this compliance check. Let's quickly try that out on one of the devices. I'm going to add this configuration here. Now I'm going to do a compliance check again on this. So earlier, nothing changed uh, on CBP side when we ran that. Now with this compliance check, you see that one of my devices turned yellow. And if I go here and see, it tells me that the configuration of, for this device is out of sync. Now we have known about any change that was made. And if we want to uh, see what change was made, we can again do a right click on this device and go to manage and go to configlet. Now here you see that I have these two configurations attached to it. So one is the reconciled config that I talked about, which CVP learned for this device. And the other is the banner configuration. Now here you see this uh, container icon next to banner, which means this configuration has been applied to a top level container. It could be the spine container, or it could be the first container that we saw in tier one. Now this uh, configuration use uh, of putting at the container level comes in handy for any kind of configuration that is common to lots of devices. Say, for example, your radius configuration that would need to go to all your uh, access devices. So you can create a configlet for that and put it on your leaf or access container. Your NTP or DNS uh, configurations would be common to your entire network. Those can be put on the top level containers. So that way you can, uh, the devices at the bottom can just inherit it from uh, the container above them. Now, if I go ahead and validate this configuration, it will tell me what are the new lines that the device has, which CVP does not know about. So if you look at this row now, we have zero new lines, zero mismatch lines, but two lines which can be reconciled. And if I click this, it will show me what are those lines. So this is the configuration that I made from the CLI, the interface VLAN 100 and this IP address. So it shows me this change. Now, if I want to incorporate this change to my designed configuration, I can do a reconcile. But say I don't want this uh, configuration to be there on the device, I can do a save. So that will get rid of this change. And this current configuration will be pushed to the running configuration. So I'm quickly going to save this. Now you see this, there's this green halo around this. And once I save it, a task will be generated for this particular device. So that means a task is pending. It has not been executed yet and the change hasn't been made to the device. So this configuration still exists here. So the configuration is still here. And for the task to be executed and the changes to be pushed, we would need to create a change control later on. So we'll look at that a little later. Let's come back to the, uh, these options here. Coming to the configlets, these can be created manually or using Python scripts. And here I have some examples to show you. So one is this phone profile configuration, which I have created manually. So this is the configuration where I have clubbed in lots of commands that I want to apply on certain interfaces where I expect a Cisco phone to be connected. I have made, I have bundled this in one profile and created a configlet for that. And the good thing here is that you can validate this configuration before even pushing it to the devices. So say I want to try it on one of my leaves. I can go and uh, just, add that, oh, sorry, and click validate. So at this time, what CVP is going to do is, it's going to create a config session on this device, ROI-151, and it's going to try these commands. So if they are executed successfully, we'll get this message of successfully validated. But if there are any errors, it will throw that errors here, and it won't be validated. So in both the cases, none of these changes are actually pushed to the device. It's only a config session in which we try out these commands and then abort it and return. Now, other ways to write Python scripts for this. One example I have here is to create an MLAC configuration. So this is the Python script that we have for this. And here is a form that you can fill and generate your configuration. So if I click generate here, you can see that my whole MLAC configuration has been created. We have the VLAN 4094 for the uh, control plane traffic. Then we have the uh, port channel created, uh, which is a peer link port channel. And we have the SVI created and the whole MLAC configuration. So using these scripts, you can create your network specific configuration that you want. 
And on the top here, you can see that where all this has been applied. So if you apply it to certain containers, it will show up here. And if it's applied to some devices, it will show up here. Now, same thing here, we can validate this uh, configuration once it's uh, generated and it will error out or uh, successfully validate if it's a valid configuration. It's worth noting here, there's a, you know, a lot of people see the, the Python script. They say, I don't, you know, I don't know Python. How do I do that? There, there's, a, there's a lot of examples out there on GitHub, on Arista's GitHub for um, configlet builders that you can download and import into CVP. Um, so just know like the, you know, the basic configlet she showed is kind of the first steps of, of walking into automation with CVP, but with configlet builders, you can go really far. And we have customers that go really far with them. So back to you, Neha. Thanks, Matt. Coming to the image management, this is the place where you create your image bundles. Here you can see I have lots of image bundles created and here you can add your extensions or any other software patches as part of the image bundle. So for example, this bundle 4.23.2f.sy, this is only this image, um, the USY image that I have. And on the 4.23.2 underscore extension, I also have this extension added to it. Now these, some of these extensions do not require a reboot of the device. So that can be uh, checked or unchecked from here. And if you just push this to the device and it already has this 4.23.2 image, it will not go ahead with a reboot. It will just get this extension and it will install it. Now this is the bundle where I have one particular um, software patch from one of the CVs that is affecting our system. And uh, I also have this Terminator Swix. So let's quickly try this out, how to push this particular extension and install it with just doing it from CVP with one or two clicks. This is the device that showed that it was being affected by uh, those CVs. So if I go here and show you right now, there are no extensions on this. We have this a cool command, which is the watch. It will run this command every two seconds. So I'm going to run this here in the background. I'm going to push this uh, image bundle to this device. And in the end, I want to see that it has these two extensions on this switch and they are also installed. Let's go ahead and try that out. So this is the device, PTT306. You go here and similar to what we did with the configlet, we'll do the same with the image bundle. So here, it's a, this is already associated. So I click update and save. Now we see that there's a task generated for this. And if I go to the tasks, it will show up here. So for PTT306, we have the upgrade image task. And for LD384, we have this update config task that we created earlier when we saw that there was some VLAN configuration made through the CLI. Now to execute these tasks, we need to create a change control. So let me do that. And here, once we go to the change control, we can look at the changes that are being made. So here the current software version is 421.3, but it doesn't have any extensions on the device. And we are upgrading to, to this bundle EOS 421.3, which has this image and the two switches that we see here. So I'm going to go ahead and approve this. We'll talk about change control in uh, more detail after snapshot configuration. Okay, so while this is running in the background, uh, let's uh, look at the snapshot configurations. So the snapshot service uh, runs as a scheduler to capture device snapshots periodically. It captures the outputs of commands that are specified in this template. Like we have these three templates here and it's done on the uh, scheduling frequency that is set here. So this template has this, these three commands, which I want to run every five minutes on these devices. So the three commands are show IP BGP summary, show IP route summary, show BGP VPN summary. So every five minutes, CVP is going to get the outputs for these and keep it stored uh, in CVP's database. And these can be ex accessed from uh, this device view here under snapshots. So we have these snapshots uh, being taken here. And if it, you go to one of the snapshots, you get this output here, like for all the three commands. And the great thing about this is that it can be compared to any previous snapshot by just using this compare feature. And this is true for any of the tables on the switch or the running configuration, the software version, anything you want to compare to what was some time ago, you can do that. So here you set the time and 
the device. So this comparison is also available for different devices and it will highlight the differences like this. So left side is uh, the data from April 9 on, at this time. And you see these are the change, the things in red, they are not there in this new uh, data, which is from May 19th. And the new things in, on May 19th are showing up in green. So these snapshots, they are very useful to see the state of a device before or after any change control. So we'll see how to use it as part of your change controls to, to make this helpful. Now coming to the change controls, these are provided for your workflow automation for any kind of day to deployment and configuration tasks from a single visual touch point. And we can collect snapshots pre and post change control and also run some built in checks to identify any kind of inconsistencies. So I'm going to show you this uh, MLEG upgrade change control that I've created. So here you can see that I have these three different stages, peer one upgrade, peer two upgrade and post upgrade checks. So whenever I'm doing an MLEG upgrade for multiple devices, I would do it one switch at a time to minimize any kind of traffic uh, loss. So in this case, say I have 50 MLEG devices. So I have 25 MLEG pairs. So I'll put all 25, uh, 25 of those in peer one upgrade and other 25 in peer two upgrade. And then I'm associating these different inbuilt checks, which can be added from here. So we have these different inbuilt checks that are provided by CVP. So in this case, because it's an MLAG upgrade, I would check MLAG health. And when you select this, what it does is it will run some commands on the devices like show MLAG um, ISSU uh, compatibility, show MLAG config sanity, show ISSU warnings, all those commands are run and it's make sure that the MLAG state is good on both the devices. So that is what I have done here. I've added these two cards for checking MLAG health. And now you see that these two are put in parallel. So what that means is that these two actions will be executed in parallel. So if I select any task from here, say, um, it will give me this option of how you want to run it, whether it's uh, in parallel or it's in uh, a series this one, select ordering. So here, these two devices, these two tasks have been chosen to be run in parallel. And all these that are put here are chosen to be run, in, run serially. The good thing about this is that this is uh, re really easy to control. You can move around these tasks the way you want it. And you can even move it between different stages to show you how easy it is to schedule this workflow in a way you want the task to be executed. So here I have put these two MLAG health checks, then I'm getting the BGP state output from these two devices. And then I'm upgrading my one of the devices, peer one. Now, before all these tasks are con executed successfully, we will not move to the peer two upgrade. If and only if all the tasks pass here, then we are going to go to peer two upgrade. If any of the task fails, CVP is going to revert all the changes that it has made. And we'll go back to the original state it was before this change control was started executing. Now, in case of configuration changes that are made through this change control, how CVP is able to do that is it creates these checkpoints on the devices every time before a change is made through CVP. And in case something goes wrong during this change control, it will go back to the device and put that checkpoint configuration that it had on the device. Now, peer two upgrade, I have the second upgrade, and then I'm again checking the MLAG health on both my devices because both the devices have been upgraded. And lastly, I want to do this post upgrade check again for a snapshot. And then we can go ahead and compare the snapshots taken before the change control and after the change control and make sure that all the BGP state and the routing state is same. I think it's worth adding, um, even, even though we're taking snapshots to show kind of different points in time, uh, because of how CloudVision collects data, you can always look at things like the routing table or MAC table historically, even without a, a snapshot. So like if you, that's kind of the beauty of telemetry is you can go back and say, hey, what, what, were, what were my next hops or what routes were I missing Saturday night at 2 a.m. when nobody was looking at the network? And so this is, this is just a really kind of powerful thing of this, this amount of data you have. Uh, but snapshots are a way to specifically get the kind of data you're looking for at a certain, you know, certain point in time. So this is the view that Matt is talking about. We have all this information available, which is continuously streamed to CVP. And then you have this timeline view, which using which we can look at this data from uh, some time earlier and also compare any of this data. And we also have this, uh, these filters available by which you can search for any specific information we are looking for. 
Coming to the events page. So this is the place where you get visibility into anything and everything important that could be happening on the devices in our network. And these events are generated using uh, syslogs and some other conditions which are met in the predefined interface or device level events, which are specified under uh, configured event generation. And I'll show you that in, uh, in some time. So here you can see all these events that are happening on these different devices, LD384, 385, that the interface exceeded outbound utilization. So if you go here, you can see all the details of uh, this particular uh, event, like what was happening at what time. And if you look at this timeline view, you can see that there are these different dots which tell you the state of the network, like what happened at what time. So here we have these four different uh, levels of criticality, whether a message is informational, warning, error, or it's critical. And you see that here. Now by quickly looking at this, I can see that some critical event happened here. And if I click that, it will tell me what's the problem. So it says that the device terminator version is too low on this particular device. And the minimum supported version is 1.6.1. So we need to upgrade our terminator version on this device. So this way you are quickly able to know like what's wrong with the network. Now here we also have this option of acknowledging events. So say this last event, I want to acknowledge it. So I can go ahead and acknowledge this particular event and it will stop showing uh, in my events on this side. And if you want to look at the acknowledged events, we can click on show acknowledge and it will list all the acknowledged events as well. Now coming to the event generation part. So these are the other uh, things that it uses to generate these different events. And all of these have a default values, uh, value assigned to them or which will be triggered when it's succeeded. So let's look at some examples. So here, this is the high CPU utilization. Um, and the default rule is that we'll generate warning event when the CPU utilization crosses 85% threshold for 30 seconds of time. And this is the default that we have. So any device when the CPU utilization will cross 85% for consistently 30 seconds, we will generate an event for that device on CVP. Now, if I think that like, I want to keep it more conservative, I want to be warned about this a little before. So you can add this rule where I have this another informational rule that I've set and I want to get a notification when the CPU utilization crosses 70%. So by this, we can go to the device and look at what might be happening and avoid any issues that could happen with high CPU utilization. Same thing can be done for your uh, routing tables, your MAC tables, all that. So here, these are all the options that we have. You can also set uh, these things for your monitoring of your queues, like if there's some congestion happening there. Um, then routing table exceeded utilization threshold. So the default is 90%. You can set it to something like 75%. So this can help mitigate issues even before they happen. And the other option here that you have is configuring notifications. So CVP uh, integrates with uh, lots of different platforms. So we integrate with Slack, VictorOps, PagerDuty, Ops, Genie, et cetera. And we can send these alerts in the email via any of these, uh, to any of these platforms. And there's this search feature available here. So you can search per um, event, per device, or per interface. So if I quickly put a search for Q, so it will tell me what all events uh, happen related to any Q size. And here we can see that on some of the interfaces on this device, BRI 270, there has been a Q size work threshold event that has been happening. And it was active on this day at this time. Coming to the metrics page. So this is uh, the place where you can create your custom dashboards to quickly look at interface or device level metrics that you are most interested in. The results can be grouped by metric or for all devices, or they can be grouped per device for different metrics. And they can be grouped for in a table, which will show you, give you the flexibility of adding devices and metrics at the same time. And lastly, you can also do get an aggregate view of all the metrics for multiple devices. So let's look at some examples that I have created beforehand. So one is the interface status. So this is an aggregate view of uh, the interfaces or uh, two of my devices. And then I have this power over ethernet uh, dashboard that I have created to look at the approved power, port state, and total power output from my PoE devices on the interfaces where I expect an end host to be connected. 
So on these four ports, I have my phones connected and quickly by looking at this dashboard, I can see that something is wrong on ET16. I expected a phone to be connected here, but it shows as detecting. So either the phone went down or something else happened by which, because of which we are not able to detect this particular phone on this port. So we can go and uh, investigate the issue. Coming to the uh, Lanzi dashboard. So Arista has this feature, which is the latency analyzer by which you can monitor congestion on different queues on the device for all the interfaces. So here um, I am monitoring that data. So all that can be streamed to CVP and I'm monitoring those queue drops, queue length and the transmit latency. So if I were to show you some Okay, so it's loading the data. Okay, so here you can see that uh, at this time, 7.44 a.m. to the morning, there were some queue drops that were happening on ET51. And if you uh, go here, you can see how many drops were happening at different times. You can move this bar and you can see it. the value changes. And uh, it, this uh, dashboard here tells me what was the transmit latency at that time and the queue length. So here it tells you that it was 4029 segments. So one segment is 256 bytes. And now you can also see that there was some, it took some time to load. So on ET52, we saw lots of congestion. So these dashboards give you this quick view of whatever you are interested in. And if you have seen some issues in the past, you can create custom dashboards based on your, uh, that kind of data that some issue had happened on this interface before. So I want to keep a track of this. If anything happens, I want to be notified. And these dashboards help you to do that. So I have this another dashboard where I'm monitoring the VLANs and route count from multiple devices. So this is an example of uh, getting the same metrics from multiple devices. So this way, these uh, metrics come in pretty handy by the creation of, of these dashboards. Next is the Cloud Tracer. So Cloud Tracer is the monitor connectivity feature, which gives visibility into the availability of network interconnects and any services across uh, private, public, and hybrid cloud environments. So here we'll get uh, these different statistics using uh, pings and HTTP probes, which will be sent to our uh, monitored host. So here I have some monitoring from BI209 and BRI270. So from BI209, I'm monitoring my connectivity to these three devices, which is BRI270, uh, which is another lead. Second is the CVP node, which is this current node. And third is the DHCP server. And same thing I'm doing from BRI270. Now to look at some of this data, if I look at, want to look at the HTTP response time, I go here and then I can see this uh, table and it tells me how the response time looks like. And you can click on any of these and you can see how it has been looking like for some period of time. And we can also get the raw data from here and to look at the other related metrics, which is also available on the left pane that we saw, the latency and packet loss at any time. This can be compared in this uh, graphical view. Similarly, you can see the jitter, the latency and the packet loss. Now, again, we have this timeline view, which makes it really useful if you want to look at how this data was sometime earlier. Coming to the topology view, this is the topology screen, which provides an explicit visual representation of the connectivity of the network. And it also allows us to understand our network structure and performance easily. So this is created based on LLDP information and any VHLAN configuration that is there on the devices. So everything that you see here, uh, which is solid lines, is obtained through LLDP. And these dotted lines, they have been obtained through VXLAN configuration. So here, um, see what CBP does is it automatically deduces the roles of these devices. So you don't need to specify anything. So once it gets that LLDP information and sees uh, what all neighbors it has, and the config, it can also look at the configuration, so it can decide what device can be an actual spine, what can be a leaf. This can be based on the number of uh, uplinks, number of downlinks it has, or uh, number of neighbors it has as compared to its own neighbors. So that can help it make these decisions, what role a device might have in the network. And then it creates this visual representation for us. And these can be collapsed or expanded if we want to look at certain things. 
uh, like it gives you a little more understanding of uh, your network when you want to narrow down what all I have. So here I have grouped these uh, devices as per my uh, floors. I have these five floors and I have uh, named them according to that. Now coming to the link overlays, we have lots of options here to look at different statistics on the topology view itself to better understand the network. Some of the options that we have is active events. So if you go to this link overlay, you can see that the different kinds of events that we saw earlier are highlighted on the topology. So if you see something is like dark red, you can quickly go and click that and see. So on this link, I have some error. And if you click it, it will tell you what the error is. So the, this particular link went down unexpectedly and so on. You can go to any of the links and click on that and it will take you to the active events that might be happening in the network. And we also can see the traffic throughput. So at any time, if I want to see how much traffic is uh, flowing through these links, you, you will get this color coded uh, uh, topology. And here, if I hover over these, you can see that there's about 405 Mbps of traffic on this link. And there's about 1.2 Gbps of traffic on this link. So here you see everything is in greens and blues because our Ixia ports are 10 gigs. So you don't see anything up in the reds, but here these links are 100 gig links. So in this, traffic throughput view, you will get information about all your traffic through the links. Then we also have this VLANs and VXLAN overlay where we will color code according to the VLANs that are being carried on the different links. And then you also have this ability to search for a particular VLAN here. Now, anything that shows up in yellow, that's a trunk. So it might be carrying more than uh, one VLAN. So same uh, kind of search is also available for the VXLANs. Then we have this uh, network wide search where you can search using the name um, of the device or the MAC address or a model. So let's search for uh, something. So I know I have a phone in my network which, uh, whose MAC address starts with uh, D0. I'm going to search for that. So even a partial search works here. So I just put D0 and it showed me this. And if I click on this, it will take me exactly where that particular device is in the network it's so easy to find out where my, any of my phones are, where my access points are, or you just put it in the search and you can get it. So this search works for any kind of line cards, modulars, uh, model numbers, or even serial numbers of the devices. Okay, so this is uh, the topology view. Let's go to the device. There a, uh, there's a question on topology view about having <clears throat> basically non-arista devices show up. So. Um, so, so the way, as, uh, as Neha described, the way this view is built is with LDP and combining that with streaming um, information from the switch itself. Neha, if you can scroll down to the phones uh, that are showing down there. So what we will show, we'll, we'll show directly attached devices, whether they're ours or not, as long as they're talking at LDP. And we'll actually overlay whatever kind of polling data we can get from them. So if we have, you know, streaming data from the interface from the, like from the BRI270 switch, We'll show that. Otherwise, we'll actually show uh, SMP data uh, into this view. So it will support uh, non arista devices kind of at the edge, as long as an arista device is attached to it. But the telemetry element is kind of key to, to making it work. Go ahead, Neha. Sorry. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, and these, uh, this topology is also updated in uh, real time. So combined with all the continuous snapshots, live updates, and this network wide search, it can really help uh, faster root cause and pinpoint any changes. Okay, let's go to the devices page. So this is where we were earlier, where we looked at the inventory and the compliance overview. Now coming to the connected endpoints, this is the place where you can see all your IoT campus or any DC endpoints, which get their IP addresses via DHCP. So here you can see that I have the Cisco phones, uh, Avaya phones, and some Ixia DHCP client and some other Extron electronics devices. So this uh, legend tells me this in little more detail how they are classified. So if I look at this, it tells me that these are VoIP devices and they are further segregated as a IP phone or the Cisco IP phone, a Cisco VoIP phone. And then if I go, it's a Cisco IP phone and these are the three models. So CVP is getting all this information and classifying it for us uh, in these various subtypes. Now, whenever some uh, issue happens in the network, we either know the MAC address or the IP, and it's rare that we would know both of those. So if you want to search for any of those um, hosts, you can search it in the address search feature here. Let's pick uh, one of the phone uh, IP addresses. 
and search for this uh, phone in the network. So here, when I put the IP here, I am able to see the information about this particular IP address. So this is on VRA 270 on port VLAN 75. And this is the IP, uh, the SVI, which is the gateway for uh, this particular phone. And the description that you can see here is that it's a voice VLAN. Now, uh, the, uh, you don't see a lot of information about the transceiver and the interface type. So that for that, you can go to this uh, show results for the MAC address. So the associated MAC address will give you more details on the Ethernet 40. So here you can see what's the transceiver type, what's the speed and what's the MTU. And you see some other information on this side also, the host name, the LLDP neighbors. Now, it is also integrated with our topology view where you can go and say show in topology and it will take you where it is connected, which access or leave device it is connected to in the topology. So this is my BRI 270 where I have that phone. So it is one of these phones that I was looking at. So if we go here, we can see that this is, this is that IP uh, that we were searching for. Oh, I forgot to mention that in our latest release, which is 2020.1, this search also extends across the ARP and IPv6 tables of devices. So you can even search for one of those here. Coming to the comparison view, uh, this is the place where you can compare uh, the differences between two devices at the same time, or two devices at two different times, or the state of a single device at two different times. So this one uh, could come in handy for your any maintenance that you do. Um, say for example, we have multiple spines in the network and we want to do some maintenance on one of the spine. So after this maintenance is done, we want to make sure that the state of that spine is similar to what it was before, or just compare it to the other spines and look at the different say routing tables or neighbors that it has, that number should match. So let's quickly try this out. Here, uh, you can select the time when you want to compare it. So say I'm checking for LD384 at current time on which I did some maintenance to LD385 at current time, but you can change the time from here if you want this. So now I can see that my learned routes on LD385 are more. So this device, which went through some kind of maintenance, does, did not learn all the routes that it was supposed to. So from this quick comparison view, you can see what are the differences that, that are there for different devices or the same device at different times. This is the device comparison. Now coming to the devices page again, we have the traffic flows feature, which, is, which will show you the S-flow and IP fix data from the switches. So our, all our campus devices, have this ability to export this S-flow or IP fix data to CVP, and that can help you for more insight into what kind of traffic might be flowing through your network. So here you have, you can see that we have uh, this sampling rate, the number of active hosts and the total flows. And you have this option of filtering using any of these source host ports, destination hosts or ports. Okay. So here, these are all my destination ho hosts. And to look at what kind of traffic might be flowing coming from a particular host, I can look at these destination ports uh, output. Now, this is also integrated with our um, connected endpoints feature. So if I look at all of these endpoints and say, I want to see what kind of traffic might be coming from this particular device, you can click here and it will bring you to this traffic flows page where the data will be filtered on based of this as the source IP. And we can see who, uh, which all end devices this host might be talking to and what kind of traffic is coming from this host. So you can get this real time correlation of any kind of events and the kind of traffic that's flowing uh, in your network. We have this power over ethernet interface statistics that you can see. So for our, all our POE devices, we have this feature here. So you can see the total approved power from this device, total granted power and the total output power. And you can see that this is changing in real time. So this is the great thing about CVP that you can see everything as it is happening or changing. All the end hosts are withdrawing from this device is showing us uh, as it is changing. So this is all about the devices and CVP walkthrough. So CVP, in conclusion, is a great network management tool, and I hope I was able to give you a good introduction to it. Uh, Matt, is there anything you yeah. want to add? 
Thanks, Neha. Uh, yeah, if you could go to the event, there was a question about uh, lands. Um, if you could go to events to show on the queue monitor. Yeah, perfect. So to take a step back for those that are familiar with LANs, so LANs is short for latency analyzer. And a lot of times in networking, you're reactive to problems. Um, you're reacting to output discards. And so the, the whole idea with LANs is we're gonna show you when a buffer, like when an interface or buffer utilization is getting high before we actually get to the point of dropping packets. So there's a, there's a lot of, basically we're monitoring in real time at the microsecond level, um, how much of the buffer is utilized before it actually starts dropping packets. And so the idea is that if you start dropping packets, latency is going to go up. What we're doing here is we're actually streaming this data into Cloud Vision. So when, when that buffer utilization gets high, like if you click on that uh, top one, uh, Neha, that Ethernet uh, 51. So here we have a manually set threshold of 3,000 um, basically segments. And so we haven't got to the point, you can see, you can see kind of the three tiers there. You see uh, transmit latency. Q length and then and then drops and see we, where we're actually dropping packets versus where we actually have a, a high Q length. And so there's a lot of knobs and configurations you can do to enable LANs on a switch. The question came up, you know, it seems complex to configure on the CLI, but really all you have to do is the command Q monitor length. Everything beyond that is kind of custom tailoring it to certain lengths or certain thresholds. Um, but, but by default, the switch is just, if you just do Q monitor length, that will turn it on. That will also enable um, telemetry to start getting streamed for LANs. That's a little more um, detail on, uh, on LANs. Here, we'll show you a running section here. Yeah, so that, uh, that command right there, and then the, the log just shows the last 30 uh, key length messages so you don't get a log flood. So. And you need to enable the streaming to send right. it to Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's another thing. So QMonitor streaming uh, and then no shut will actually enable that the streaming of the data from the switch towards CVP so you can get the cool GUIs and event notifications and things like that. So cool. I think that I think that answered all the CVP questions we had come in. So uh, Neha, thank you. Uh, great work. So what we're going to do now is uh, if Charlene's ready, we're actually going to get into some of the EOS specifics of campus. Again, this is the same operating system we use EOS for in the data center, at your WAN edge, at your TAPAG, anywhere else you have Arista. It's the same EOS we're using there. So um, what Charlene's going to do is go, go into some specifics, starting with PoE, kind of a fundamental for, uh, for campus. And then she's going she's gonna to go into some other things too. So with that, uh, I'll kick it over to you, Charlene. Oh, Matt, I just want to show this. Uh, I forgot to show this earlier. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so the extension got installed. I, that's a good point now. So the, the extension she pushed earlier got installed. It didn't, you know, didn't cause the switch to reboot or anything like that and enables to basically hot patch the switch. The other thing I wanted to point out there was, um, you know, we did it at the device level here, um, but just like we were talking about, you know, pushing banner configs and things like that in CVP, you could push a image bundle because everything runs the same EOS. We could push an image bundle at that top level container and push a hot patch to your entire environment uh, with just, with just a, a few clicks in CVP. So thanks Neha. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Neha. Okay, back to this diagram. This is our test bed. And it has some key elements of uh, Arista campus design. We have a spine layer, spline layer, and leaf layer. And leaf layer are all the PoE switches. And some of the spline layer, we collapse the leaf that makes the uh, spine layer having PoE switches as well. We have uh, access points, Cisco phones, or wire phones, and emulated firewalls connects to the PoE switches. Leaf connects to the splines through L3 connections or L2 connections indicated by these blue lines. A typical L2 connection is a MLAC port channel that connects to this pair of switches that forms a multi-chassis lag. And this provides one logical gateway for the leaf which is in the L2 domain. And the port channel here provides a non-blocking, non active, active forwarding path. This pair of MLEX are uh, four slot chassis that we have. So you can imagine we can hook up a lot of the leaves or PoE switches. On part four here, we have uh, MLEX. Not only that, this pair of MLEX are PoE switches. That means that we can hook up uh, APs and phones and uh, XDA ports. In addition to that, on the uplink ports, we connect more leaf or PoE switches. As the demand goes, 
or we can scale up the end holes pretty nicely. So you can see with the MLAC architecture, we have the basis of stacking in the Arista campus design. And the last one that we have in the test bed is really that 96 uh, M gig port switch. That's uh, really the hardest thing from the oven. And uh, we managed to put it in the test bed right before the lockdown. And currently we have uh, Ixia connected to it. And we are going to put phones and APs uh, pretty soon connected to that device. So all of these uh, IX are Ixia ports. You can see all the leaves has connection. This is a WAN edge router. We also have a connection to Xia to provision traffic from north to southbound. As, and also we have a lot of traffic going east-west between the pots. Back to the spline. We have all L3 connections to the spine. And all of these connections are 100 gig ports. The spines are really the anchor for the whole fabric. We have uh, route servers running for eVPN, and also they are the RP for multicast in the underlay. And they also provide the connection to the WAN edge router, which has reachability to the internet or another data center. We have uh, BGP running in the underlay and also BGP eVPN running on the overlay so that we can uh, build L2 extension between pods. That topic is not in today's talk, but welcome back to a custom pod with us. We have uh, services connected to the network, either in-band connection, say, say the DXCP server that we have, or a lot of uh, out-of-band connections to VMs, such as the CVP or the radius and ice and uh, clear paths and all those uh, services. So that's what we have in the test bed. So I'm going to talk about the PoE. I'm going to um, go over these uh, features and maybe do a little test. So let me just go to a device. Show PoE will show almost like 90% of uh, PoE features and the parameters that you can tweak. So you can see this switch. We have uh, 48 of the MGIG ports, and the last four can run up to 60 watts of power. And the first 40 is capable of doing 30 watts. So maybe we can do a grip on power, then we can see the ones that really have power offering to the end host. So we have about eight devices. We can see the capability and each single port is a PSE enabled and the priorities as for settings, I'm going to show you a little later. And every single port is LDP enabled and you can change the configuration to disable that. And every single port you can turn on legacy device, uh, legacy detect. If you have a legacy device that doesn't run LLDP, say in the example, then you can just uh, turn this on. And by default, LLDP is enabled. So we are able to find out the, say the device type for the requirement for the power based on the class, right? In this case, this is a class two, so we know the maximum power required for that device is seven watt, and we granted seven watts. And this is uh, uh, telling us this port is powered up. And if it's not, then it's trying to do a detecting. The last few columns tells us the current power used by the device and the current the voltage. And every single port has a temperature sensor. So this tells us the current temperature on that port. So Neha already showed you this output on the CVP. You can also do filter there to uh, focus on the devices that's uh, currently powered on. So let's see what kind of configuration we can do. And if we go to POE, the interface, a lot of these uh, configuration can be done on the interface level. So you can turn off the power offering by saying PoE disabled. By default, it's on. That means there's no PoE disabled. 
And yeah, you can turn on the legacy detect and you can limit the power either by the class or the number of watts. And you can turn off the LDP neighbor. And let's take a look at priority. The four settings I mentioned earlier is uh, going from low all the way to critical and low is being the default. So say these four ports, right, has the same priority low. If the switch doesn't have enough power to support all the requirement for these four ports, the higher number of ports will get shut down first. That means the lower number of ports has a little bit more higher priority than the high number of ports. What else we can configure? What about PoE link? Oh, this is talking about the action when we link down this port. So say you want to do some maintenance on that port, you do a shutdown. So you have an option to maintain the power or uh, bounce the power on and off for the end device. So some of your APs would take a long time to do a power cycle. So it may be a pretty good idea to maintain the power. So PoE has uh, other options. By the same token, what about we do a reboot on the whole switch? And we have the same control to maintain the power or power off that device on this interface. Since we are talking about reboot is really a global operation. So this uh, configuration is available on the global level. So we, if we do reboot and action, sure enough, we have it here uh, available on the global configuration level. So show active shows me what I configured here. It's a very simple configuration. We say we want to maintain power and by default is power off on the switch level. And for the interface level, again, we come back to that. You can override that global configuration by saying PoE reboot uh, power off, say then it would take precedence over the global configuration that we specified here. And for the link, the default behavior is a little bit different. And the default for this one is really to maintain the power. It's uh, pretty straightforward. So for now, let's see how much uh, power we really have for the whole system. So show environment power shows me I have only one power supply. So in production, we is a good idea to have two to provide redundancy. And these uh, power supply runs at 1050 watts. And currently the whole system runs uh, at 112.5 watt. And if you remember that Neha show show the total output, all the uh, PoE switches is about 40, I think, it, because uh, we have other components in the, the system, right? So this one shows that uh, the additional power to power up the, the back planes and things like that, the fans and things like that. So that's everything about power. I hope uh, you are a little empowered. Thank you, thank you for that. We'll go ahead and get into uh, to the phone section. Just setting it up for as we get into this. You know, there's a, there's a number of phone vendors out there. Arista works with all of them, and we kind of classify them into kind of one or two buckets: VLAN aware and VLAN unaware. And the difference here being basically tagged or untagged. If they are VLAN aware, we have a number of ways we can pick up what kind of device it is. If it is a phone, to put it into into the uh, VoIP VLAN. From that, we can actually make decisions on how we handle that in the data point. So uh, Charlene's going to show that. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to go back to this switch pretty soon to look at the phones. So on this port, we uh, have uh, a Cisco connected to the port with this uh, MAC address. And we're going to take a look at the LDP neighbor detail. And the phone's going to get the IP address from the DXCP server. And we have a DXCP relay running in the network. The configuration is very straightforward for the VLAN unaware phones such as uh, a typical Cisco phone. Uh, to configure the port to connect to a phone, these two lines are um, the essential ports. We say this is a trunk port running phone, even though this is a trunk port, right? We say it's actually we're not going to detect any packets going in and out. So we use the MAC based VLAN assignment to find out that 
the MAC address from the phone, uh, from, from a phone would be assigned to this VLAN 75. How do we find out the MAC is actually belonging to a phone through the LDP neighbor protocols? So let's take a look at the switch. So this is that uh, port from that slide. Let's take a look at the show active. And I just want to focus on the configuration for the phone. Yeah, the same configuration. And the additional line is really telling us for everything else, I mean, other than the voice, we're going to put it in the native VLAN 340. So we're going to take a look at that VLAN when we do the .1x test. So the configuration is very straightforward. So let's take a look at show LDP neighbor Ethernet 40 in detail. Now we can see what's really behind this port. And the system capability is an essential piece of information that we know is really a phone. And this uh, port number actually has the MAC address, but that packet, the LDP, LDP packet, right, already tells us the MAC for this bridge or phone. Then we know we are going to put it in that voice VLAN 75, right? That's how that works. And um, a lot of good information from LDP that we can use and say device type endpoint class three. So we know we can grant the power 15.4 watts. And let's uh, go down a little bit. We can see this full doesn't do tagging for the voice as well as the signaling. A very typical Cisco phone. And as a typical trunk port, we're going to do, uh, do a QoS trust on uh, the cost value in this case is five for the normal uh, voice traffic and signaling is four. So we, we know uh, how to do QoS. And LDP Matt tells us a little bit more about this phone. Again, it's a Cisco phone and that's the model. And you can see that model pretty nicely in CVP uh, as uh, Neha showed earlier. So LDP is the key to discover all your phones and handle all the phones. And let me see how many phones that I have. Show neighbor classification. It tells me I have uh, four phones. So that's consistent with uh, what Neha showed earlier. And the three, this uh, last three are Cisco phones. And the first one is a, a, a via phone. Just uh, give you a little, uh, take a look at the configuration on the via phone port. Because the Avaya phone is a VLAN aware, that means it would tag the packets. We can just configure that as a regular trunk board. And we allow two VLANs, the voice VLAN as, a, as well as a data VLAN. Voila, the configuration is there. So we can you know, take care of uh, both uh, scenarios, right? The VLAN aware and the VLAN unaware phones. And um, take a look at the MAC address. So for the phone, it's all about the MAC, MAC address, right? Remember this one, D0C7. We're going to use this MAC a little bit more. So this tells me, indeed, it's uh, assigned to VLAN 75. And static tells me it's just doing MAC-based VLAN assignment. And this MAC belongs to this port, ET40. Pretty straightforward. And we also get IP address from the DXCP server. So we do show ARP interface. VLAN 75 uh, It's going to do a lot of, oh, OK, not that bad. So definitely the four phones. Um, where is that one? Yes, E0C7 was this IP address. We got that from that um, DXCP server. Very simple, everybody can do it. Oh, before I close out the phone session, let me show you, show you something pretty cool. So uh, the configuration has uh, quite a few lines, right, for, the, for different phones. How about we create profiles? And this is a kind of a new feature that we can use for campus pretty nicely. You can do interface profile and define what goes uh, to the configuration of a Cisco phone. 
no, actually the interface that connects to a Cisco phone. So that's uh, all that four lines of uh, configuration we saw on that interface, plus a little bit more. And you can see that's how you apply that profile under an interface. So you can see the configuration can be very streamlined and very consistent across all the Cisco phones. So that's uh, everything I have about phones. You read my mind. I was just about to say, we got to show profiles. So yeah, you couple that with, um, you know, what Neha was showing around, around configlets. That's and right. They, you know, quickly go through the environment and change Cisco phones to be medium priority on, on power or change them to the in this VLAN versus that one with literally just touch in one place and everywhere you have this profile set, uh, it's going to follow it. So um, thanks. Thanks, Charlene. So um, what we're going to do next is NAC. Basically, we're using uh, Forescout in our lab here, but we work with all the NACs. We actually have all the NACs available in our lab. And that's one of those things we can go really deep on if we want to. For the sake of this virtual POC, we're just kind of showing the tip of the iceberg just to show you the generic capabilities. But if, if there's, you know, an endpoint protection use case or maybe some really specific um, kind of NAC solution that you're looking to get in your environment, we can uh, we can certainly look at that. Um, anyway, so, so Charlene, please, with that, um, go ahead and start with the uh, .1x NAC piece. Cool. Okay, back to my diagram. So this is that phone that connects to ET40. And actually behind the phone, we also have a XTA port connected to, in, uh, to the phone so that it will get authentication into the network. So as a typical phone, it would use a Mac-based authentication to log in. And this uh, XCA port, we can emulate different things. In this case, we are going to do that one X uh, EAP over land to do authentication through the switch. And the switch is going to act as authenticator to tunnel the packets between the supplicants and the servers. And the servers can have different configuration to push uh, different attributes. Say in this case, we can push a tunnel private ID tunnel private group ID and filter ID. And we will show you how that works. And also on another port, we have uh, XCA port connects to it, ET16. We're going to showcase a different scenario. So uh, that's the configuration that we have uh, on both ports. Let's just go to the switch to do to show just that. So now I show you everything on this port. Show active. And it shows more than the phones. So we, I have a PoE configuration and spanning tree. And now this is the part about that one X. Let's go line by line. This uh, PAE authenticator enables the switch to be the authenticator on this port. And this says that we have a quarantine VLAN 81. If the authentication failed, we still allow the traffic on that VLAN, but we can do something on that VLAN, of course. Re-authentication means that it would require all the end hosts to get authentication on a regular basis. The default timer is every hour, and of course you can change that. And that one export control, let's see what kind of uh, control we can have. So auto means, that's what we have here, that the port is unauthorized until it is fully authenticated. So that's auto means. And of course, uh, you can ignore the authentication by forcing the port to authorize all the end hosts, or nobody can authorize to get in, regardless is authenticated or not. So it's a good setting to have uh, on auto. And then the host mode, we can do single host or multi-host. For multi-host, there are two options. If for now, we say for every single host behind this port, we need authentication on every single one. If you do not specify authenticated keyword, do an enter here, and we will only need to authenticate the first one. And the rest of the uh, other hosts would get authorization to come in. And then the last uh, command says, uh, in addition to do that one X, we will allow end host to do MBA 
or Mac-based authentication, such as that phone. So that's uh, pretty much uh, a very straightforward configuration. So let's do some tests. Um, I have, uh, let me make this window really big. I have that um, monitor that um, SS, SSH to the same device. So we can monitor different things. So let me just uh, bounce off um, the authentication on the port. Um, over here, as uh, Neha mentioned earlier, we can do a watch. And this shows me the dot one x status on any host behind this port. So let's just uh, watch that. And over here, did we say we can drop to the Linux shell to do bash. So over here, you can do a lot of the Linux uh, commands, say the DXCP. So over here, I say I do a DXCP on the management port, on port 1812. DCP What's dump? port 1812? Yes, uh, Matt? Uh, Matt? I think you said DHCP is TCP dump, so. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. You keep me honest. So it's a uh, TCP dump. Yes. So uh, the port that we monitor is really the radius server, uh, the control port. And this is our server running uh, for Scout version two. And over here, there's a, another way to run the Linux command. You just put the bash in front of any Linux command. Say this one, we tell uh, the file uh, messages in the var lock, and we only grip whatever about that one X. So now we are ready. And we will enable this port to be the authenticator. We'll see how the phone come on board. Um, while we are waiting, maybe I can show you a little bit about the X here and the, let me just lock in. This will take some time. Oh, okay. Cisco is a little slow today, but surely it comes on board, which is good. So uh, the show that one X host shows me, remember this MAC address for the phone, uh, is using MAC-based authentication and is a success. And we know it uh, would go to VLAN 75 using a VLAN-based, uh, uh, no, 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 MAC-based VLAN um, assignment. So let's take a look at the other windows. We, say, we can see this uh, MAC address. Um, there's no dynamic VLAN configured and it's, a success, it's successfully authenticated on that port. And TCP dump tells us a little bit more about the packets, right? And this is the IP of my switch and this is the IP for the radio server and this is a access request. And now the username attribute we can see is really the MAC address for the phone. And that's port ID attribute is really the local port. And again, the calling station ID is that MAC. And the reply from the radius is really uh, accept. And the value is, again, that MAC address. Very simple and straightforward. And that's how that phone comes on board. So let's take a look at how the workstation behind the phone comes on board. We'll come back to this uh, uh, four scale configuration later. And I'm sure you guys already have some ideas, right? How the MAC address, at MAC address being configured on the radius server. So this is that port. This is my Ixia. And I have a lot of traffic going. And that's how um, Neha show you the traffic flows pretty nicely. Uh, we have uh, multicast, unicast, and eVPN traffic going. So um, that's just a little sidetrack. Let's focus on these two ports. That first one, connects to that XDF phone, and the other one connects directly to the switch. And the first one first, this is the Ethernet stacks. So we have uh, two MAC addresses, uh, 002F01 with the last digit one for the first host and two for the second host. And on top of that, we have uh, that one X running. 
and the protocol type and um, uh, TLS version can be specified here. And the most important or the most uh, important one that I care about is really the username. And of course, uh, the password should be configured, configured, configured on the radius server. So let's just uh, fire up the first one. And this tells me uh, XC is going to push that configuration to the hardware, the FPGA. So it takes a little time, but uh, not that bad. It comes on, becomes a success. So now we can see that MAC address using EPO. And it gets to a VLAN ID. How come the phone doesn't have a VLAN ID, but this one does? Let's take a look at the TCP dump first. And for this one, it's not using the MAC address for the username anymore, right? It's the real name, Prabaha. And that's the MAC address for Prabaha. And ha, huh, the access accept message has a lot more information now. Again, is the username Prabaha. And it has more than that. You see there are two attributes that get pushed from the radius server. One is the tunnel private group ID, the dynamic VLAN. Let's take a look at, let's do a show run section that name. And we can see the configuration. Actually is really the name for VLAN 341. Now it makes perfect sense. The radius server just tells us the name of the, dynamic, the, the VLAN that host should go into. And the switch will map to the local VLAN. So that means uh, on different PoE switch, you can map that to a different VLAN. And let's take a look at the um, syslog message. So in this case, it has dynamic VLAN. And you can see it already make that translation on the syslog message, right? So it's a little bit more intuitive if we look at the message. And by the way, this one is the same thing that you do a show syslog and grip the dot one X. And the uh, war log uh, message has a little bit more. And I kind of like to show you how to, you know, grip things from uh, using a Linux approach. That's all. So it's uh, kind of nice that uh, we know the dynamic VLAN name can be uh, assigned by the radius server. And what about this filter ID? is really the access list. And let's do a summary. We can see that because of that filter ID, right? We know that this uh, access group or access list has to be programmed on this ingress port, ET40. And what's really in this access list? It's a very simple access list. We permit everything. And just uh, zero seconds ago, there was the last match. Okay, nine seconds now, just passed. So note that uh, the code that we use right now, uh, we have to have this access list configured on the switch. We just have uh, the latest US image we're going to upgrade pretty soon that uh, you can use radius to push this whole configuration into the switch. So that's dynamic VLAN and also access list. How about we do the second post? Ah, second one comes up much faster. From the syslog message, it tells me this one doesn't have a dynamic VLAN assigned. And sure enough, it doesn't show it here. And what VLAN it would get on the interface? We have a default native VLAN configured, this guy. So let's take a look if that MAC address really gets into that VLAN. And if I show MAC address and address and that address, sure enough, it gets to VLAN 340. So, and TCP dump shows, yes, um, that private group ID is not there, right? Um, so this uh, shows us uh, you can use a radius to assign the dynamic VLAN or you can just use the one configured on the interface. Let's take a look at another test. 
on the other port. You can see the configuration here is uh, almost the same as the other one, minus the phone configuration, because this port connects to Xia directly. So uh, in this case, uh, we assign the VLAN 341 as the default. And everything else, uh, let me change that to host mode, uh, multi-host authentication. So that would be the same as the other one. So this is the scenario I want to showcase that say you have a bunch of uh, PCs or workstation using Pixie Boot to log into the network. So when they first come in, they don't know how to speak that one X. So they will use a uh, raw traffic to do Mac based authentication to get into the network. So there's two hosts here. And then later on, they got the IPs and they got the configuration, they know how to speak that one X. So they would change the authentication method. They are going to say, okay, here's my uh, username, blah, 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 right? And then the switch knows, okay, we better switch over to do the more secured that one X, which is uh, EPO. So we'll see it would take precedence and it will never go back to MBA again. So let's uh, take a look at that test. And for that, let me show you the Ixian. So that's the other port that connects to the switch. Um, we will take a look at this uh, traffic uh, portion so that we can send some raw traffic first. And that's the port connected to the switch. And the only thing that really matters is the source MAC address, right? That's uh, the identity for that workstation. So the MAC address is really 002301 with the last digit one, and the second one is two for the last digit. So just uh, please memorize that. And I'm going to send the traffic. And we're going to, ooh, we need to change to the other port. Yep, they use uh, Mac based authentication to come in and they all get assigned to 341 as uh, indicated by the configuration. Okay, let's uh, go back to Ixia and we will let the traffic keep going. That means uh, it will just uh, try MBA if you let it be. And then we come to this uh, scenario, this is where we can configure a lot of the protocols. So the, the stacks uh, ethernet, shows uh, we have the same MAC address, right? One and two, and then the dot um, one X stacks shows uh, we use the same username, Prabaha, and the same credentials. So let's just fire them up. And let's uh, watch a little closely. Hey, everything's the same except the authentication methods changed using EPO. Let's see. And they also have a dynamic VLAN. Oh, actually, in this case, uh, the dynamic VLAN 340 is assigned by the radius, but it's just the same as uh, what I configured on the interface. So, da, da, da. let me see. Da, da, da. That's uh, what that does. So, we showcased how two hosts, right, to do uh, MBA to log in to the network first, and then uh, they do EPO to log in, and then EPO would be the de facto authentication method that the switch would remember. And um, yeah, we have the phone using MBA and also uh, Xia to do EPO. Um, how about we do um, a failed case? And over here, um, I'm going to do change. I have to stop this. And this uh, first Prabaha typed his name wrong. For that, let me. To Prabaha one. And I'll s let's see how the two guys come on board. You see, the first one failed, and then it got allocated to that quarantine VLAN 81, and the second one still comes in like a champ. 
So that's uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, everything about that one next. You can see we use a radius server to push those configuration. Seems like we have uh, some time. Let me just show you briefly of the configuration that we have uh, on the four scout. Seems like we have some uh, potential some uh, users of uh, four scout here. So this is the phone. Uh, uh, MAC address uh, for that Cisco phone. Uh, we do not configure the uh, more attributes, but when they do use a uh, radiance. So remember the first uh, port that connects to ET40. Let's take a look at the radiance configuration. So this is how we configure the uh, filter ID to push the echo and also the dynamic VLAN name using the tunnel private group ID. So this is the first two hosts that connects to 40, ET40, and this is uh, the host that connects to ET16. And if we go a little slow, you can see the NAS IP address is really the management ID, management port. ID for the switch and the username is really Pabaha and for that we just uh, push the filter ID. So that's uh, pretty much uh, it about the integration and that one X. Cool. Thank you Charlene. Uh, if you could go to the uh, last slide. So ne next one of those things that um, you know we could spend two minutes on it, we could spend two weeks on it depending how uh, how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go. Again, this, uh, you know, for the, for the virtual PFC, we just tried to reach the uh, kind of high level topics just to, um, you know, show you, show you a little bit about the capability. But we know NAC is one of those things a lot of people um, go a lot further with and we're happy to do that in a, a custom PFC. So, uh, Charlene, if you could show the last slide just to kind of wrap things up. You know, we appreciate y'all taking the time to spend with our, with our POC team a taste of what they're capable of. We're happy to do these uh, custom and tailored for you, uh, so just get with your local account teams to do that. In addition to that, we're, um, we're doing Wi-Fi lunch and learns as well as Cloud Vision automation deep dives, so we got 10 feet deep on some of this stuff today. We can actually go a lot, lot deeper and, and uh, learn a lot as well. We're doing the uh, virtual campus cloud builders where we're, again, a lot deeper into, into these technologies as well some of the mind share and where they're going uh, from here. There's some collateral out there that you guys can look at. So there's the there's a campus white paper, cognitive campus white paper, as well as, as VUS, CUS, where you can do kind of network emulation. So you can download these to your laptop or whatever and actually run through these things. But again, thank you for your time today.